The Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy Chapter 10 Every village has its idiosyncrasy, its constitution, often its own code of morality. The levity of some of the younger women in and about Trantridge was marked, and was perhaps symptomatic of the choice spirit who ruled the slopes in that vicinity. The place had also a more abiding defect. It drank hard. The staple conversation on the farms around was on the uselessness of saving money, and smock-fronted arithmeticians, leaning on their ploughs or hoes, would enter into calculations of great nicety to prove that parish relief was a fuller proposition for a man in his old age than any which could result from savings out of their wages during a whole lifetime. The chief pleasure of these philosophers lay in going every Saturday night, when work was done, to Chaseborough, a decayed market-town two or three miles distant, and returning in the small hours of the next morning to spend Sunday in sleeping off the dyspeptic effects of the curious compound sold to them as beer by the monopolizers of the once independent inns. For a long time Tess did not join in the weekly pilgrimages, but under pressure from matrons not much older than herself, for a fieldman's wages being as high at twenty-one as at forty, marriage was early here, Tess at length consented to go. Her first experience of the journey afforded her more enjoyment than she had expected, the hilariousness of the others being quite contagious after her monotonous attention to the poultry-farm all week. She went again and again, being graceful and interesting, standing moreover on the momentary threshold of womanhood, her appearance drew down upon her some sly regards from loungers in the streets of Chaseborough. Hence, though sometimes her journey to the town was made independently, she always searched for her fellows at nightfall, to have the protection of their companionship homeward. This had gone on for a month or two, when there came a Saturday in September, on which a fair and a market coincided and the pilgrims from Trantridge sought double delights at the inns on that account. Tess's occupations made her late in setting out, so that her companions reached the town long before her. It was a fine September evening, just before sunset, when yellow lights struggle with blue shades in hair-like lines, and the atmosphere itself forms a prospect without aid from more solid objects except the innumerable winged insects that dance in it. Through this low-lit mistiness Tess walked leisurely along. She did not discover the coincidence of the market with the fair till she had reached the place, by which time it was close upon dusk. Her limited marketing was soon completed, and then, as usual, she began to look about for some of the Trantridge cottages. At first she could not find them, and she was informed that most of them had got on to what they called a private little jig at the house of a hay-trusser and peat-dealer who had transactions with their farm. He lived in an out-of-the-way nook of the townlet, and in trying to find her course thither her eyes fell upon Mr. D'Urberville standing at a street-corner. "'What, my beauty? You here so late?' he said. She told him that she was simply waiting for company homeward. "'I'll see you again,' said he over her shoulder, as she went down the back lane. Approaching the hay-trusses, she could hear the fiddled notes of a reel proceeding from some building in the rear, but no sound of dancing was audible, an exceptional state of things for these parts, where, as a rule, the stamping drowned the music. The front door being open, she could see straight through the house into the garden at the back as far as the shades of night would allow, and, nobody appearing to her knock, she traversed the dwelling and went up the path to the outhouse whence the sound had attracted her. It was a windowless erection used for storage, and from the open door there floated into the obscurity a mist of yellow radiance, 
which at first Tess thought to be illuminated smoke. But on drawing nearer she perceived that it was a cloud of dust, lit by candles within the outhouse, whose beams upon the haze carried forward the outline of the doorway into the wide night of the garden. When she came close and looked in, she beheld indistinct forms racing up and down to the figure of the dance, the silence of their footfalls arising from their being overshoe in scroff, that is to say, the powdery residuum from the storage of peat and other products, the stirring of which by their turbulent feet created the nebulosity that involved the scene. Through this floating, dusty debris of peat and hay, mixed with the perspirations and warmth of the dancers, and forming together a sort of vegeto-human pollen, the muted fiddles feebly pushed their notes, in marked contrast to the spirit with which the measure was trodden out. They coughed as they danced, and laughed as they coughed. Of the more rushing couples there could barely be discerned more than the highlights, the indistinctness shaping them to satyrs clasping nymphs, a multiplicity of pans whirling a multiplicity of syrinxes, Lotus attempting to elude Priapus, and all was failing. At intervals a couple would approach the doorway for air, and, the haze no longer veiling their features, the demigods resolved themselves into the homely personalities of our own next-door neighbours. Could Trantridge, in two or three hours, have metamorphosed itself thus madly? Some Salenti of the throng sat on benches and hay-trusses by the wall, and one of them recognised her. "'The maids don't think it respectable to dance at the Flower de Luce, he explained. They don't like to see everybody see which be their fancy men. Besides, the house sometimes gets shut up just when their gents begin to get greased. So we come here and send out for liquor. "'And when be any of you going home?' asked Tess, with some anxiety. "'Now, almost directly. This is all but the last jig.' She waited. The reel drew to a close, and some of the party were in the mind for starting but others would not, and another dance was formed. This would surely end it, thought Tess, but it merged into yet another. She became restless and uneasy, yet having waited so long it was necessary to wait longer. On account of the fair the roads were dotted with roving characters of possibly ill intent, and, though not fearful of measurable dangers, she feared the unknown. Had she been near Marlott, she would have had less dread. "'Don't he be nervous, my dear good soul,' expostulated between his coughs a young man with a wet face, and his straw hat so far back upon his head that the brim encircled it like the nimbus of a saint. "'What's your hurry? Tomorrow is Sunday, thank God, and we can sleep it off in church time. Now, have a turn with me?' She did not abhor dancing, but she was not going to dance here. The movement grew more passionate. The fiddlers behind the luminous pillar of cloud now and then varied the air by playing on the wrong side of the bridge, or with the back of the bow. But it did not matter. The panting shapes spun onwards. They did not vary their partners, if their inclination were to stick to previous ones. Changing partners simply meant that a satisfactory choice had not as yet been arrived at by one or other of the pair, and by this time every couple had been suitably matched. It was then that the ecstasy and the dream began, in which emotion was the matter of the universe, and matter but an adventitious intrusion likely to hinder you from spinning where you wanted to spin. Suddenly there was a dull thump on the ground. A couple had fallen, and lay in a mixed heap. The next couple, unable to check its progress, came toppling over the obstacle, and in a cloud of dust rose around the prostrate figures amid the general one of the room, in which a twitching entanglement of arms and legs was discernible. "'You shall catch it for this, my gentleman, when you get home.' burst in female accents from the human heap. 
those of the unhappy partner of the man whose clumsiness had caused the mishap. She happened also to be his recently married wife, in which assortment there was nothing unusual at Trantridge, as long as any affection remained between wedded couples. Indeed, it was not uncustomary in their later lives to avoid making odd lots of the single people between whom there might be a warm understanding. A loud laugh from behind Tess's back in the shade of the garden united with the titter within the room. She looked round and saw the red coal of a cigar. Alec d'Urberville was standing there alone. He beckoned to her, and she reluctantly retreated toward him. "'Well, my beauty, what are you doing here?' She was so tired after her long day and her walk that she confided her trouble to him, that she had been waiting ever since he saw her to have their company home, because the road at night was strange to her. "'But it seems they will never leave off, and I really think I will wait no longer.' "'Certainly do not.' I have only a saddle horse here to-day, but come to the Flower de Luce, and I'll hire a trap and drive you home with me." Tess, though flattered, had never quite got over her original mistrust of him, and despite their tardiness she preferred to walk home with the workfolk. So she answered that she was much obliged to him, but would not trouble him. "'I have said that I will wait for them, and they will expect me to now.' "'Very well, Miss Independence. Please yourself. Then I shall not hurry. My good Lord, what a kick-up they're having there!' He had not put himself forward into the light, but some of them had perceived him, and his presence led to a slight pause and a consideration of how the time was flying. As soon as he had relit a cigar and walked away, the Trantridge people began to collect themselves from amid those who had come in from other farms, and prepared to leave in a body. Their bundles and baskets were gathered up, and half an hour later, when the clock chime sounded a quarter past eleven, they were straggling along the lane which led up the hill towards their homes. It was a three-mile walk along a dry white road, made whiter to-night by the light of the moon. Tess soon perceived, as she walked in the flock, sometimes with this one, sometimes with that, that the fresh night air was producing staggerings and serpentine courses among the men who had partaken too freely. Some of the more careless women also were wandering in their gait, to wit a dark virago, Car Darch, dubbed Queen of Spades, till lately a favourite of d'Urberville's. Nancy, her sister, nicknamed the Queen of Diamonds, and the young married woman who had already tumbled down. Yet, however terrestrial and lumpy their appearance just now to the mean, unglamoured eye, to themselves the case was different. They followed the road with a sensation that they were soaring along in a supporting medium, possessed of original and profound thoughts themselves and surrounding nature forming an organism of which all the parts harmoniously and joyously interpenetrated each other. They were as sublime as the moon and stars above them, and the moon and stars were as ardent as they. Tess, however, had undergone such painful experiences of this kind in her father's house that the discovery of their conditions spoilt the pleasure she was beginning to feel in the moonlight journey. Yet she stuck to the party for reasons above given. In the open highway they had progressed in a scattered order, and now their route was through a field-gate, and the foremost, finding a difficulty in opening it, they closed up together. This leading pedestrian was Carr, the Queen of Spades, who carried a wicker basket containing her mother's groceries, her own draperies, and other purchases for the week. The basket being large and heavy, Carr had placed it for convenience of porterage on the top of her head, where it rose in jeopardised balance as she walked with arms akimbo. "'Well, whatever is that a-creepin' down thy back, Carr Darch?' said one of the group suddenly. All looked at Carr. Her gown was a light cotton print, and from the back of her head 
a kind of rope could be seen descending to some distance below her waist, like a Chinaman's queue. "'Tis her hair fallen down,' said another. No, it was not her hair. It was a black stream of something oozing from her basket, and it glistened like a slimy snake in the cold, still rays of the moon. "'Tis treacle,' said an observant matron. Treacle it was. Carr's poor old grandmother had a weakness for the sweet stuff. Honey she had in plenty out of her own hives, but treacle was what her soul desired, and Carr had been about to give her a treat of surprise. Hastily lowering the basket, the dark girl found that the vessel containing the syrup had been smashed within. By this time there had arisen a shout of laughter at the extraordinary appearance of Carr's back, which irritated the dark queen into getting rid of the disfigurement by the first sudden means available, and independently of the help of the scoffers. She rushed excitedly into the field they were about to cross, and, flinging herself flat on her back upon the grass, began to wipe her gown as well as she could by spinning horizontally on the herbage, and gathering herself over it upon her elbows. The laughter rang louder. They clung to the gate to the posts, rested on their staves, in the weakness engendered by their convulsions at the spectacle of Carr. Our heroine, who had hitherto held her peace, at this wild moment could not help joining in with the rest. It was a misfortune, in more ways than one. No sooner did the dark queen hear the soberer, richer tone of Tess among those of the other work-people, then a long, smouldering sense of rivalry inflamed her to madness. She sprang to her feet, and closely faced the object of her dislike. "'How darest thou laugh at me, hussy?' she cried. "'I couldn't really help it when t'others did,' apologized Tess, still tittering. "'Ah, uh, thus think the best everybody dost, because the best first favourite were he just now.' But stop a bit, my lady, stop a bit. I'm as good as two of such. Look here, here's at thee. To Tess's horror, the dark queen began stripping off the bodice of her gown, which, for the added reason of its ridiculed condition, she was only too glad to be free of, till she had bared her plump neck, shoulders, and arms to the moonshine, under which they looked as luminous and beautiful as some Praxitelian creation in their possession of the faultless rotundities of a lusty country girl. She closed her fists and squared up at Tess. "'Indeed, then, I shall not fight,' said the latter, majestically. "'And if I had known you was of that sort, I wouldn't have let myself down as to come with such a horridge as this is.' The rather too inclusive speech brought down a torrent of vituperation from other quarters upon fair Tess's unlucky head, particularly from the Queen of Diamonds, who, having stood in the relations to d'Urberville that Carr had also been suspected of, united with the latter against the common enemy. Several other women also chimed in, with an animus that none of them would have been so fatuous as to show but for the rollicking evening they had passed. Thereupon, finding Tess unfairly browbeaten, the husbands and lovers tried to make peace by defending her, but the result of that attempt was directly to increase the war. Tess was indignant and shamed. She no longer minded the loneliness of the way and the lateness of the hour. Her one object was to get away from the whole crew as soon as possible. She knew well enough that the better among them would repent of their passion the next day. They were all now inside the field, and she was edging back to rush off alone, when a horseman emerged almost silently from the corner of the hedge that screened the road and Alex d'Urberville looked round upon them. "'What the devil is all this row about, work-folk?' he asked. The explanation was not readily forthcoming, and in truth he did not require any. 
Having heard their voices while yet some way off, he had ridden creepingly forward and learnt enough to satisfy himself. Tess was standing apart from the rest near the gate. He bent over toward her. "'Jump up behind me,' he whispered, "'and we'll get shot of the screaming cats in a jiffy.' She felt almost ready to faint, so vivid was her sense of the crisis. At almost any other moment of her life she would have refused such proffered aid and company, as she had refused them several times before, and now the loneliness would not of itself have forced her to do otherwise, but coming, as the invitation did, at the particular juncture when fear and indignation at these adversaries could be transformed by a spring of the foot into a triumph over them, she abandoned herself to her impulse, climbed the gate, put her toe upon his instep, and scrambled into the saddle behind him. The pair were speeding away into the distant grey by the time that the contentious revellers became aware of what had happened. The Queen of Spades forgot the stain on her bodice, and stood beside the Queen of Diamonds and the newly married, staggering young woman, all with a gaze of fixity in the direction in which the horse's tramp was diminishing into silence on the road. "'What be ye looking at?' asked a man who had not observed the incident. "'Ho, ho, ho!' laughed a dark car. "'He, he, he!' laughed the tippling bride, as she steadied herself on the arm of her fond husband. "'He, he, he!' laughed dark car's mother, stroking her moustache as she explained laconically, "'Out of the frying-pan into the fire!' Then these children of the open air, whom ever excess of alcohol could scarcely endure permanently, betook themselves to the field-path, and as they went there moved onward with them around the shadow of one's head a circle of opalized light, formed by the moon's rays upon the glistening sheet of dew. Each pedestrian could see no halo but his or her own, which never deserted the head-shadow whatever its vulgar unsteadiness might be, but adhered to it, and persistently beautified it, till the erratic motions seemed an inherent part of the irradiation, and the fumes of their breathing a component of the night's mist, and the spirit of the scene, and of the moonlight, and of nature, seemed harmoniously to mingle with the spirit of the wine. End of chapter 10